Um, this will be somewhat different and somewhat the same in terms of Kathy's presentation. Uh, for example, there will be no PowerPoint slides, uh, or there will be one PowerPoint slide, I should say. Um, so I'll direct your attention right here. Um, but part of the similarity is this idea of, of sharing knowledge and collaboration and productive platforms. Let me start with the, with the context. I'm a professor of education in the Graduate School of Education here. I'm a school teacher by trade. And my interest is in access to knowledge as a school teacher, as a professor. And in the knowledge that I'm particularly interested in accessing and having my students who have been learning to read when I was a school teacher and now as a professor in science, technology and society, having them analyze and be critical of, is the knowledge of universities. This is simple minded in one ha hand and it's a big problem on the other because the knowledge in the universities is a little bit locked up. And so I want to talk to you about the unlocking of the knowledge in the universities. By that I mean the peer-reviewed research and scholarship, that whole publish or perish element that I live with every day, that other faculty members here live with every day. Uh, I want to talk about the efforts we've been doing to create a platform that will open that knowledge to the world, that will open it to physicians and lawyers and school teachers, that will open it to scholars in the developing world, that will open, to my, open it to my colleagues. Because even here at Stanford, we don't have access to all, I shouldn't perhaps tell you this. Did you sign NDAs? <laughs> There's one on your desk. You're not to disclose this. We don't have access at Stanford to all of the research in the world. We're working with this incomplete, now it's very, very good. It's the best of any institution I've worked with. But even the big H in the East doesn't have access to all of the research. And that to me is a problem for researchers. It's a problem for the public. So let me take you to the end point and then I'll work backwards to how we develop this platform. The end point is an open source platform, an open source software platform that we've developed called Open Journal Systems. You can look it up on your computers. Open Journal Systems is open source in the sense of being free. It's open source, and I'll talk more about this. People can contribute to it. But it's open source in a way that is rhetorical. I'm trying to convince people that the research that we publish on our open journals system platform should be freely available. I mean, heck, we made the software free and we gave it to you. The ingra No, you're not supposed to work it that way. The ingratitude pitch, the guilt pitch, no. No, my mother, no, she wouldn't, no, we can't go that way. We have to say that we've demonstrated the possibility of sharing software. The open source software movement has demonstrated the ability to share and build effective systems. And I don't need to take you through all of that, the litany of open source software successes there have been. So we took this principle of open source software and we said, why don't we use open source software to create open access to research and scholarship? Why don't we set an example and why don't we build a platform? So we did. And I'll take you back to the beginning, but let me take you to the end point. 8,600 active journals in the world today use our platform. We are the largest single platform, commercial, proprietary, open source. We're the most widely used, and I have to say we have a slight price advantage over others, so it's probably not a fair comparison. In fact, I got to the point where I was saying it was cheaper than free, because free wasn't good enough anymore. <laughs> and so I would explain all the money they would save by working on a platform. So 8,600, and this ranges from the Smithsonian, no, let's go the other way. This ranges from African Journals Online, which is in South Africa, is a, is a uh, African Journals Online is a, is a platform, our installation spread across 500 journals. There are 500, actually there's close to 600 journals on African Journals Online, a central point of access for African journals. It goes from there all the way down to the Smithsonian Institution that this morning we were working on some designs for. And because the Smithsonian Institution is dedicated to making all of its knowledge freely available. So we have, in a sense, achieved a level of success in terms of changing the balance. We think that about half the research in the world, not just because of us, but because of other people like us, half the research in the world is now freely available for the period 2014 back uh, 10 years to 2004. But half in itself is a huge achievement. But half in itself is a very frustrating proposition. A doctor who goes in 
to find the latest research on a particular patient of concern, it's a 50-50 chance they'll be able to see the article. You could say that's fabulous. Because uh, 10 years ago, it was a zero chance. But for my money, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. It has a kind of Russian roulette feel to it. And I'd rather it was 100% in terms of the medical profession. And so does the US government believe that. Because of all of the money that the US government gives to support medical research through the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, all of that research has a clause attached to it that says the research must be freely available within 12 months. And so we can look forward to a future. Did you notice that 12 months part? We look forward to a future in which the knowledge will be freely circulating from the NIH. What's with the 12 months part? We did a study of doctors. We gave them free access to the research here at Stanford and we said, use what you can. And many of them were too busy, two thirds of them were too busy to look at the research. But a third of them did and on average one article a week in terms of their medical practice. But what about that 12 month embargo? The doctors, of course, were very respectful. They didn't want to look at any research that was as recent as 12 months. No. Half the research the physicians felt they needed to treat their patients were within that 12-month embargo. So we have lots of issues around this idea of access to knowledge, but I'm not here to talk about access to knowledge. I'm here to talk about the development of a platform. So now I've given you the end point. Let me go back to the beginning. In 1998, when this project started, the Public Knowledge Project, when I was a professor, I still am, a professor of education, and I would excite the teachers I was working with, the student teachers I was working with, about the power of research, and then I would send them into the world, never thinking that they had no more access to research once they became teachers, that when they crossed that stage and graduated, we took out a pair of scissors and cut their library cards in half and recycled the plastic. So there was an issue for me. We did a collaboration with the Vancouver Sun. This is, uh, took place at the University of British Columbia and the Vancouver Sun agreed to work with us in putting research and journalism together. They did a great job on the journalism. I couldn't share the research. I didn't have permission to share it with the public. And at that point in 1998, I said, as an educator, I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to convince people that the research and scholarship needs to be made freely available. So we started to build a platform that would help journals move online. It was a big deal in 1998 to move journals online. They said, of course, the knowledge won't have any value if it's online. Can you get back into that mindset? There's no truth online. If you, as soon as you put a research, and New England Journal of Medicine was like, if anything appears online, it cannot appear in the New England Journal of Medicine. I know, it's, it's hard to get your head back in that era. You ask your, your parents about this, they'll, they'll bring you back to that age of, of, of an earlier sense. So in 2008, we started working on a platform. This was early days for open source software. In fact, it was still called free software. It was early days for open access. It wasn't called open access, it was called free to read. In fact, I really like that, actually. It has a great ring to it. Open access, yeah, whatever. Free to read. You can see the button. So we were into free to read. We built this platform. I had no understanding of what open source software was, but I had the good fortune to hire an undergraduate student at $15 an hour. I say that quietly because he could sue me so badly, for, but he wouldn't. Kevin was a very generous student. And he explained to me the principles of an open source platform, an open source software platform. Not only would it be free, it would be open to other contributions. Not only would we build it for the world, the world could help us build it out. And so in about 2001, we released the first version of OJS, Open Journal Systems. And I can remember I was in Newfoundland, speaking to the Memorial University Philosophy Journal, trying to sell this at one journal at a time. And Memorial said no. If that knowledge goes online, I don't know if you know this, but if we put our philosophy online, it's worthless. Uh, and they were just sort of trying to keep me on top of these things. Um, but from that period, I spent, in fact, I did a, I had a MacArthur. Now, let me explain the, the funding and the, and the basis of this. So this is a, a research and development. We had a grant from the Canadian government to explore this issue by building software. They were more interested in the research part, the balance of research and development. And we learned how to play that card. We would always have a research component, but we would build, build, build the code to build out this platform. 
So if I can take you ahead to 2003, the MacArthur Foundation, in a peace and security grant, said, yes, you can go around the world and see if you can convince others to share their knowledge, because that might contribute to peace and security of the world. And I was deeply touched by that. Like this idea that we might, by sharing knowledge, build peace and security. I don't think we've moved away from that point. But at any rate, I was touched at the time. It was a remarkable journey. Uh, there were three or 4,000 people by the time I finished that I had presented the idea to. And I got back to Vancouver. Uh, I, I went in different periods over the peri year 2003, 2003, 2004. And at the end of that, I kind of sat down and said to myself, well, let's see what happened. Let me think about how many emails. Let me go through. And, and, and I was entirely, it was a complete, there were no journals. So I had gone to each of the continents and not a single journal had taken it up. I had explained it to thousands of people, particularly, particularly in the Philippines, at least a thousand in the Philippines. I'd explained it, but it hadn't got taken up. I was somewhat ahead of my time. Instead of throwing in the towel, we continued to build the platform. And by that point in 2003, we must have had 30 or 40 or 50 journals using the platform. That meant we had 30 or 40 or 50 people who were unhappy with 30 or 40 or 50 different aspects of our software. And the community began to build. <coughs> in particular around languages. We're now in about 35, and I say about because the Russian's a little bit behind in the latest release, um, but the Vietnamese is up to date, and the Hindi is, is lagging, and Arabic is. So we have 35 languages, all of those contributed by the community. We had lovely debates between the Quebecois and the Parisian French. Someone from Spain wrote us and said, the word you're using in Spanish for review, it is not even a word between Latin America and Spain. But the idea that a community could come together and start building a platform that was based on a principle of sharing knowledge. And at the same time, we were competing against the five major corporate publishers who were taking over an increasing proportion of the market from 10% from to 20%, probably in 2005, about 30 to 40% of the market. And so we had this very strange relationship to access to knowledge. It was either free or they were paying $28,000 a year for the journal Brain Research. Now that includes the supplements, I have to be fair to Elsevier. But it was a, it's a crazy irrational system and it's still in place today. But let me talk more about the, this journey in terms of, of, of the development. We have in 2008 the, one of the breakthrough moments. The NIH decides in 2008 that the federal money, the 28 to 30 billion dollars, that sounds ridiculous, no it is, 28 to 30 billion dollars, 28 to 30 billion dollars that they're spending in medical research, both in the United States and around the world, needed to have some public accountability. And in 2008, they decided that all of the research that was published with, with a uh, federal grant of any size would, as I said before, be made open access. And since that period in 2008, the federal government has moved, the White House has, has issued a, a, a directive to all of the federal agencies. It hasn't happened completely yet, but all of the federal agencies that have over a $10 million research budget will be making sure that all of their research, wherever it is published, and all of the publishers have agreed. They have agreed because they're willing to charge $3,000 an article to authors to make the articles open access. They have agreed because they've realized that the future is open access. But in the process, they're still scrambling for a financial model where some of us are still working <coughs> in, on this principle that open access should be open for authors uh, and, and open for readers, open for scholars, and open to professionals. So in terms of the platform, let me take it a little further. In, in 2012, we ran into a situation uh, around the humanities and social sciences. What had happened in that period is that more and more money was going into journal publishing, that the journal prices were increasing still by subscription. These article processing charges, the $3,000 an article, were still increasingly taking up budgets of universities. And the monograph, the book, was suffering. That in fact the unit of thought was at issue. So the, book, the ability for libraries to buy books was declining. And we had this scary realization that we had contributed with our platform to the article being the largest unit of thought. 
and that no one was really thinking through in a coherent, consistent, critical, well-indexed fashion the monograph. And so we put the brakes on and we said we need to think about the open monograph. We need to think about the book as a revered object, a unit of knowledge. And so from 2012 or so to 2014, we tried to develop, and we have developed, Open Monograph Press. We've tried to develop a, a way of moving the book into the same open environment. Now this is something that is happening for our project, but it's something happening more globally. At Stanford University Library, a year or so ago, we passed the one million e-book point. We have over a million electronic books in the library. And as a scholar, I can tell you my first response was, not on your life. Where would I have the books behind, when I'm doing my Skype, photo, uh, Skype interviews, how would, where would I have the books showing behind me? Would I have to get some sort of wallpaper for that? I, I, I need the physical books. I love the smell and the feel of the physical books. That was three years ago. Now, when I want to find something, I don't go through my penciled marks in the margin and try to find where I thought I had a good idea about something. I go into Google. And Google Books in particular, as it works its way through the courts, I go into Google Books and I find it. The electronic book has arrived and it's happening very quickly. So with Open Monograph Press, we're working with the Smithsonian Institution to move its entire collection online, available, and searchable. So when it comes to mollusks, you know where to go. Now, in terms of the development, let me talk a little bit more about the, the kinds of things we're working on. So we have a, a situation where we have 8,600 journals that are using this platform. It's distributed. And we distributed it on purpose as a software platform rather than creating a central source because we wanted to build the local capacity. In Vietnam, let me step back a little bit to about 2008, 2009. In Vietnam, there were no journals available online in Vietnam. In 2008, they agreed to experiment with OJS to move their journals online in, in cooperation with an organization called INASP, which stands for the International Network for the Availability of Scientific Publications. I know, believe me, it wasn't easy to learn that acronym. INASP worked with us in Vietnam. In one year, we moved 24 to 30, probably about 30 in all told, 30 journals online. But we hosted those journals. Within a year, they asked to have the server, uh, sorry, the whole installation move to a server in Vietnam. And the idea that Vietnam would serve up its own journals. It's the only country we worked in, and we have worked in, in many, many countries around the world, where the science journals, normally when we work in Latin America, Southeast Asia, we run into the situation where the humanities journals and the social science journals are in the native language, the local language, or languages in India particularly. Um, but the science journals, the biomedical journals, are in English. In Vietnam, complete Vietnamese across the board. The beginning now of some translated abstracts. But the sense of the whole makeup of knowledge online, the diversity, is part of this issue. And so that Vietnam in a year, in two years in terms of their own uh, control of the installation, moved online. They went through a period uh, about two years ago where they stopped adding journals. Uh, and then in the last year, they've picked up again. Similarly, in Africa, we have 500 journals and African journals online. And there's still a he hesitancy and a reluctance, and there's still a, a donor economy and, and a whole series of complex factors that are funding these journals, that are supporting these journals. And so I don't want to create a, a picture that is simple or a picture that makes it look, as it were, straightforward in terms of moving this knowledge online. But what's happening today, in terms of this development, is there is a general trend, a general thrust. And it's happening in the social sciences and humanities, and it's happening in the biomedical field and the sciences. And that general movement is to an openness of knowledge. And that the platforms we build have to be equally open. And they don't have to be, as our project is, entirely within the university. The, non the public knowledge project is not an, a, a, a non-profit. The Public Knowledge Project is still a research project based here at Stanford and at Simon Fraser University, as Martha mentioned. It's based, in the it's based in the Simon Fraser University Library. This is a cooperation, and I want you to just take this picture in for a moment. The idea that the libraries and the journals would cooperate 
on the funding of publications. I know, it just seems so radical. No, no, no. You should be selling to the libraries. You should be competing against the other publishers to get a greater market share in order to expand. No. There's something about the quality of research and scholarship. Not applying it to other fields, not making judgments about other markets. Something about the quality of that knowledge that needs that integrity and wholeness of access. And so we have 1,000, 1,200 journals in the United States using our software, and almost all of them are being hosted in libraries. All of the web services are being covered by the libraries. As a demonstration that the research produced by the libraries, excuse me, <laughs> produced by the universities, is something that should circulate in the library, in the library and through the library to the university. That the model that is sometimes characterized, the researchers produce, the library buys back the research. It's not an effective model. So what I want to suggest to you in conclusion is that there are multiple economies out there. And that the idea of a single best knowledge platform for collaboration and productivity is a misreading. That there are different classes of intellectual property at issues. And that research and scholarship that is largely federally funded or that is, comes from nonprofit organizations as generous as this one operates on a different economy and that we cannot, we need to clarify, let me not say cannot, let me po be positive, that we need to clarify that kind of association. And to give you a very good example of parallel play across those economies, I would point to our association with Media X, that we're working through Media X with sponsorship from Kanika Minolta on the development of a markup language, actually not the development, we have the markup language, everyone's agreed on that, on automating the parsing and, and markup of documents so that the quality of the document in developing countries can be as good in terms of its look and feel and copy editing as a document that comes from the New England Journal of Medicine. And we're working with Kanika Minolta in this parallel play where we're building for an open source community to mark up the research articles of scholars no matter where they are in the world. And Kanika Minolta is using a similar process and use, sharing the testing and, and the, the improvement of the parsing or markup of the documents for its corporate interests. And this idea that we can work in parallel play, that we can trade off on principles like open source software, like respect for different kinds of intellectual property, like a notion that open source is always, do, always used in terms of its contribution to the community as a whole, is the principle that drives the public knowledge project and drives our association with groups like Media X. Thank you very much. Thank you.